Great. Thanks, Rosie, and thank you very much for the organisers for inviting me to talk uh, today about conflict. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed the conference so far, and I've learnt a lot, and I'm actually applying what I've learnt. I went to a, one of the workshops yesterday on social media, and I've added my Twitter name. Um, so that's good. Um, and I'm also going to engage much more now. Um, okay, so as, 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 is, as is routine in all of these talks, I was asked to talk about um, approaches to conflict resolution. And um, when I started putting the talk together, I had a cynical moment. And I thought, um, you know, in the last sort of 15 years of working on conflicts, these are probably the most common um, approaches to conflict resolution that I've come across. So the lovely, um, hopefully if I wait long enough, this whole thing will just go away. And the other slightly more adversarial approach um, of um, going into a conflict all guns blazing, hopefully metaphorically at times, um, and just with the aim of winning the conflict at absolutely all costs. But this would make for an incredibly short talk, um, and I'm not sure I would get away with that. So I'm going to talk about a range of conflict uh, resolution approaches that I've encountered. Before I move on, conflict resolution is not actually a term that I particularly like. I like to think more of conflict management because conflicts have a tendency to be quite long term and they often oscillate between um, being very acute and calming down and again and again and again and again. So resolution implies that it, it ends and that's fine, but actually I, I quite like looking at it in a, in a, in a different way. Um, if, I mean, obviously we had a, a wonderful talk um, about the media and it's been mentioned quite a lot. Um, it, I mean, it's very, very easy to go on any newspaper site and find a lot on conflict. And conflict makes for a very, very good story. Um, and the language used um, is, often, is often very bold. So, you know, we talk about the war of the seagulls, um, legal battles, etc. cetera. And, um, and it's undeniable that conflicts can be very, very damaging. Um, they can be damaging in terms of conservation objectives, but they can also be very damaging in terms of uh, livelihoods, in terms of well-being, etc. And actually, the way in which um, conflicts are often framed, and, and the ecological crisis at the moment is, is, is a very good example of that, is looking at it in quite a black and white way of, you know, on the one hand, you've got um, um, in, uh, um, economic growth, and on the other, you've got... Uh, ecological protection. But actually, all of those different ways of framing conflict are, I, I find a little bit frustrating because they imply that a conflict is bad, and they also um, imply that in a conflict there are always going to be losers. And so the way in which I usually um, frame uh, the way in which I look at conflicts is looking at conflicts as a potential opportunity as an opportunity for a lot of people who care very deeply about certain issues to actually discuss them and to potentially get to a situation that is, that is better. Um, and this is why, you know, throughout that sort of philosophy, it's very, very important to get a, a very wide range of voices coming through and very loud voices as well. And this is why I, I, I put up the picture of, of Greenpeace, for example. But it, it works on both sides. It's very important to have a societal debate. And these are the sorts of groups often that actually trigger that, uh, that debate and that action as well. So for me, you know, managing conflicts is all about um, trying to lead to positive outcomes, if possible. And it was within that sort of, um, that sort of uh, it's awfully small. Never mind. Um, don't, you don't need to read. You don't need to read bits. Just look at the look at the circle. Just look at the circle. Um, it was within very much that philosophy that um, we did some work for Scottish Natural Heritage a couple of years ago, and that has just been published as a policy direction. I think this month. So it sort of hops off the press. Um, and what we did there was that we um, developed a framework uh, for them, but very importantly with them to not, not resolve conflicts, because I don't think we can, we can uh, hope to do that, but at least have some key steps that need to be thought about when uh, looking at, at a conflict situation. And this work came about because um, governments and, uh, and their statutory agencies are spending an increasing amount of resources on conflicts, um, but as part of this trend, they, they tend to adopt um, I'm going to be quite provocative here, um, but they tend to adopt quite sort of reactive, quite ad hoc, quite traditional 
approaches. And so what we wanted to do was to work with, with SNH and to develop something that was actually tailored to government use. Um, and what I'm going to do for the rest of the talk is I'm going to talk about the, the little stages. So these are the little lozenges on the, on the, in the circle. Um, and I'm going to illustrate each of them. And here I'm doing a publicity publicity bit, <laughs> sorry, um, but I'm going to illustrate it with some um, examples of conflicts taken from this book that I edited with some colleagues um, last year, and it is part of the BES Ecological Review, so I'm, I'm, I feel all right about doing a publicity for it at a BES co-sponsored event. Um, okay, good, so let's start. The first, the first issue, and I do have a bit of a bugbear about this, I, I, I totally uh, admit this. The first issue that we need to think about is whether we're dealing with an impact or whether we're dealing with a conflict. And this is very, very important because each of these are going to require quite different strategies. And so it's useful to just take a bit of time to think about this. So here we've got some elephants having a lovely time um, sheltering in a tea plantation. So the problem is that they are having an economic impact because they're, sort of, they're, they're, they're trampling tea, which is not great. Um, and they're also having um, a, a social impact because they could be um, a threat to, to tea planters. So there is a threat to the livelihoods here as well. Here we've got another impact, um, pelagic longline fishing here for um, swordfish. And um, here, this is an economic activity that's having a conservation impact because they're also causing uh, mortality of sea turtles. But here, we have a conflict. And conflicts are not always this open and this brash. Huh? And I've just obviously taken a, a, a big example and, and from my native France, which is always a good thing. Um, but here, we've got um, a demonstration up here with um, some animal uh, rights activists who are calling for um, the protection of wolves. Uh, and it's on the sidelines of a protest by some French farmers who are calling on the French Ministry for the, for, for the Environment to come up with a plan to address what they see as increasing attacks from wolves on their sheep. And they've brought a dead sheep along because. Um, so that's, that's good. Um, but the thing is, I'm going to go back very quickly, just because the dead sheep is quite entertaining as well. Um, just the one thing that I want to clarify is, in the case of an impact, quite often, once you've actually understood what it's about, you can start at least um, trying out different things, such as sort of technological fixes that aren't as costly as what you might have to do for a conflict. So for example, going back to the elephants, you could try out um, some fixes like uh, chili fences, for example. It might not work in instantly, or you might have to do other things, but it, it's a fix. Um, in the case of the, of, the, of the swordfish, it was a really nice example of um, uh, scientists, engineers, uh, and fishermen all coming together to work on developing new gear and new tactics to reduce sea turtle mortality. And it really worked because it reduced the sea uh, turtle mortality by 90%. So these are really nice processes that try to address some impacts. If you're dealing with a conflict between people with very, very differing views over conservation objectives, a technological fix is often unlikely to work terribly well, and it could actually exacerbate the problem because people might not feel that their concerns are being adequately addressed. So the first thing um, that's quite important to do in a, in, a, in a conflict is to really try and understand the context within which the conflict is embedded. And conflicts don't occur in a little bubble. They're embedded within a much, much wider ecological uh, environment, mental, uh, economic, political, legislative uh, context, which needs to be understood to decide if and how a conflict can be addressed. And so here I've got... Um, bit confusing. I've got pictures of wolves from America, but I'm going to talk about Sweden. Um, the <laughs> in, in Sweden, there's a conflict between wolf conservation and um, reindeer herding. And um, the, the problem there is that the, uh, the herders uh, have got a lot of pressures at the moment in terms of the grazing grounds that they've got. Um, they've got pressures from industrial um, uh, farming and forestry. They've got pressures from mining, uh, wind, wind turbine arrays, uh, tourism, all sorts of things that are adding to the conflict that they have with the wolves. But unfortunately in Sweden at the moment, what's going on is that there's much, much more focus on wolf management rather than all these under, underlying dimensions that are also impacting on it. 
And this is the same uh, situation with uh, the conflict between cormorant conservation and um, fishing, and uh, particularly in Eastern uh, and um, Central Europe, there are all these pond fisheries for carp, for example. And the problem there is that these, the birds are, are adding to quite a lot of economic and social pressures, including um, a diminishing market for carp and lots of um, uh, fish importing companies uh, and the competition with them. Um, but there are some really nice examples of, um, of where the context of the conflict has been very, very well studied and, and understood. So this is some work from Amy, Amy Dickman and her colleagues in Tanzania. And basically there's a conflict there over carnivore conservation. And actually the economic loss from carnivore predation is only one of many, many pressures within the system. There are some very deep-seated drivers such as um, intertribal tensions and beliefs um, and other cultural drivers that are all impacting on what's going on in that conflict. So it's really important to, to, to take time to understand the context of, of, um, of the uh, conflict. Um, the other thing to think about is whether a, a, a multi-stakeholder approach is really suitable. Now, there's often this sort of weird reflex when people are talking about conflict to just bring everyone together and have a chat. And it, it, it's, a, it's a lovely idea. But the problem is that, uh, <laughs> the big problem is that often um, the, 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 there, are, there are going to be massive power imbalances between all the people that are involved, or the conflict is so acute that there is absolutely no willingness to engage. So bring, trying to bring people together is, 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 is really very brave. Um, so, 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 and, th and then there are other alternatives anyway. You can have a top-down approach of actually just imposing a decision because that's what you've got to do at that stage. Or you can do some bottom-up approaches, but maybe talk to the stakeholder groups individually first. Um, and this is what happened in Denmark, is the place I'm looking for. Um, and basically there, there was a big conflict between those who wanted to continue using lead shot for hunting and those who wanted non-toxic alternatives. And what happened there is this sort of dual approach where there was legislation that was banning lead shots in 1996, I think. And, um, and as well as that, you had a few advocates within the hunting community who were actually really pushing the benefits of alternative non-toxic um, shot. Um, and, and so within the hunting community, that was picked up much, much more easily. Um, <clears throat> yes, this is a bit of a stumbling block. Um, yeah, the, um, th okay, the, the first one is easy, the joint understanding of conflict. The, the, often when you start pe talking to people, you go in with your idea of what the conflict is about, and actually you start speaking to a few people, as Sarah this morning pointed out, and you understand that it's much more complex and people have different uh, understandings of it. So that, obviously, you need to get to grips with. But then there's this whole idea of the evidence base and the controversies that you can have with that. And I think, I'm not going to go into any uh, detail about this because it's already been discussed quite a bit, but for me, it all points to the fact that there's a huge range of other forms of evidence out there, and, and we have already um, heard about them today. And it brings with it a huge range of values, of beliefs, of worldviews, etc., that need to be understood um, in, order to, uh, in order to move forward, because it will impact on how evidence is perceived and whether it's accepted or completely dismissed. And so a few examples of really nice uh, coming together uh, of evidence. In the Moray Firth in Scotland, um, you had a very innovative process where in the conflict between seal conservation and salmon fisheries, um, local leadership and political will brought together fishermen, netsmen who'd been totally disenfranchised from the process and scientists to develop an evidence base and they identified um, and then targeted rogue seals, they called them, um, the ones that were coming into rivers and uh, preying on, on the salmon. And another much more recent one, um, again in Scotland, was where we um, were wanting to look at the interpretations, the understandings of predation of ground nesting birds uh, from scientists but also from the people who work the land, game, uh, gamekeepers, um, landowners, etc. And actually you see here 
it was great because um, there was a really sort of um, a, a range of, uh, of, of, of commonalities, if you like, in terms of their understanding of status and trends. But we did identify some species like crows where there was disagreement in terms of their status and trends. And then you can explore through a range of different methods why that can be. And so once you've done all this, you can actually start um, looking at what your shared goal is and a very important question to ask there is actually going to see the stakeholders and saying, okay, what would your idea of a managed conflict be? Um, and this is a, a, it's a very important question because it, it forces people to reanalyze their attitudes, their goals, their positions, etc. It also enables them to see from the other side what, what, what's going on and often to break down some pre preconceptions which can be very damaging. And here there's a nice example um, of the work of the, uh, the Snow Leopard Trust who are working with communities in a multi-pronged long-term approach where they've got a, a, a range of different things. They've got a handicraft uh, program, they've got a, a livestock um, protection program where they share the economic losses from, from predation. Um, they've got tourism revenue to local people. Uh, they've got a vaccination program. They've got all sorts of things that are really helping local communities deal with, with this pressure. But it, all of this does require political um, support. And the last step really is um, the need for, for long-term monitoring and adaptive management when you, once you have got that goal and that process to get to it. And this, this is very lacking in the, in the literature, unfortunately, so I go back to the Moray Firth, which I was very involved with. And here, the, 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 the whole process of long-term monitoring, um, ooh, I should say here as well that I, I've been monitoring this system um, uh, very much just because I'm interested in it. Um, so if anybody is dying to part with some funding to um, <laughs> do, the, you know, on the, just come and see me. Um, but anyway, it's really interesting because it, it went from 2002 where it was sort of community driven and it was really constructive all the way to 2011 where there were really high levels of stakeholder apathy. And now the last uh, phase of the evaluation was 2015 where actually you can really see an acute conflict looming over the horizon with the arrival of sea shepherd uh, in the area and also continued declines in salmon numbers. So will uh, this framework be used in any um, way, shape or form uh, by uh, policy? I have absolutely no idea. Um, but what I do know is that um, we can get to a better situation. Um, and, uh, and I think in order to do that, we need to get from what I see as a very reactive approach right now to a much more proactive, multi-pronged multi approach that acknowledges the complexity of conflicts. Um, we need to try and move away from quick fix solutions and take time prior to managing the conflicts to understand the people involved, to understand what their needs are, to try and understand what a long-term solution might be. And as part of that, I believe science will only be part of the solution and we need to look much more broadly as well. And we need to move away from our adversarial positions and be very, um, have very strong and inclusive leadership. And I think we need to be brave and tackle conflicts head on. Okay, that's me. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. We have a question right at the back. Ah, Guillaume. <laughs> That's no surprise. <laughs> uh, very interesting talk, thank you. Uh, could you please tell us uh, what do you view as the objective of conflict management? Is it to maximize the conservation outcomes or is it to make people happy? So I think it's both. Um, I, don't, I don't believe that it's either one or the other and that there are necessarily losers in a conflict. I think that actually the more I, the more I study conflicts, the more I realize that yes, it can take a very long time and yes, it can take a lot of, of resources, but actually you can get to situations where both can benefit. Can you get where it's not, can you get situations where both are not possible and in that case, which one do you choose? I think then the conflict just carries on and you need to, you need to find better ways of managing that conflict. But the, I mean, obviously it is a problem because you do need resources and you do need you know, quite a lot of, especially in very, very acute conflicts, you need time 
to prepare the ground for managing that content. Thank you. Have another question there? Yes. yes thank you. Um, the last slide that um, unfortunately you had to, to <laughs> rush over was really very interesting. Um, sorry, that was one of this. Uh, oh, well, the pre penultimate one then. Right. The one of the um, cyclical. Okay. Uh, too many. The one where you were showing um, the the progress you'd made on, on a particular case study, and it went from 2002 to 2004. That's the one. That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> Not that in the end. Sorry, yeah. I was busily scribbling, so I obviously missed okay. the last bit. But I think that what was interesting there is something which a number of people have been trying to do, and that is to um, be able to predict imminent controversies and Im imminent conflicts, right. and. Um, in this case, you, you've got a very nice uh, situation there to characterize yeah. the factors that build up to this, and yeah. hopefully you can intervene and stop the next controversy yeah. in that particular one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have any um, work where you've been looking at characteristics to recognize um, impending controversies to be able to step in? Yeah, and, and it's a very, very good point, and it's one that I've been thinking about quite a lot, and actually what we're trying to do in, in some work with other colleagues is actually trying to um, develop um, a tool or, or, or a way of doing things where you could actually, with very, very um, limited resources, be able to enable government agencies or statutory agencies or whatever to predict a conflict coming along. And I think here, actually, the role of social media might be something that comes into play as a, as a very sort of cheap and effective way of doing things. Mm. Thank you very much. May I move on to the next speaker?